Go with it goes after the banner. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening, everybody who is watching us online. I would like to uh, open the third uh, November Talks lecture evening of this year, and uh, I'm honored to welcome our today's speaker, Professor Matthew Carmona. I'll just say a few words about Matthew, and then we will dive into the lecture. Matthew Carmona is an architect, an urban planner, and a researcher. He is professor of planning and urban design at the Bartlett School of Planning at the University College London. He was also head of the school for several years and led the rebuilding and expansion of the school, including the redesign of its teaching programs. In 2015, he was appointed as specialist advisor to the House of Lords Select Committee on the Built Envi Environment. So he is not only a teacher, a researcher, but also an advi advisor, a government advisor, you could say. He is best known for his work in four key areas on the value of urban design, on theorizing governance of design in the public sector, on London streets and public spaces, and for his theory of urban design, the place shaping continuum. He chairs the Place Alliance movement for the quality of the built environment and is the author of numerous articles and over 12 books on which the teaching of urban design and planning in many schools is based, and also here in Prague. In Prague, he is, at the moment, a member of the jury of the Florence 21 competition for the revitalization of the Masaryk railway station area. Last but not least, Matthew Carmona is an elected fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, Royal Society for the Arts, and the Academy of Urbanism. Matthew, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And it really is a great pleasure to be uh, here tonight uh, to talk to you about the thorny question of the privatization of public space. And before I do that, I thought I might just expand just a little bit on who I am and, 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 and what I'm interested in, because in a way, it puts what I then talk about in some context. I've been a researcher for a long time, 29 years it says up there, since I signed up for my PhD a long time ago. And in that period, I've really looked at three key areas. One is what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, which is public space. So how we as citizens engage with the spaces of our cities and towns, uh, and how those spaces can be designed in such a way that allows us as citizens to lead as good a life as possible in the external built environment. And I'm going to focus on that topic tonight. But I've got two other topics that I've done a, a lot of research in over the years. One is what I call design governance, that brown circle up there. And that's really about how the public sector, whether it's national government or local government, how they intervene in the development process to hopefully secure better quality design outcomes. And my talk tonight will also focus a little bit on that as well, because it sort of cuts across this sort of design governance and the public space interests of mine. The last one is the value of design. And I think this is important for us as architects to understand that design and, and a high-quality built environment has value 
value beyond the economic. The economic is important. Without economic value, it's difficult for us to design and develop. But it also has value in terms of the social value that a well-designed place returns to us as citizens and as society. It has value in terms of environmental value, that we hopefully we'll build places that will stand the test of time and will be kind to the environment. And also health value as well, that actually we could design places that allow us to lead healthier lifestyles. And to a certain extent, my talk will touch a little bit on that as well. But mainly, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is the part of my public space agenda. So focusing on public space. Now, questions of public space and who owns and manages public spaces have been debated with great passion for many years, for decades. Unfortunately, this is an area which is more often characterized, certainly in recent discourses, by misinformation um, and dogma rather than by clarity and pragmatism. And sometimes a rather despairing pessimism pervades discussions about public spaces, about contemporary public spaces uh, in our cities. A pessimism situated in, I suppose, a criticism of the neoliberal city, a criticism in particular of the position that that, that, neolib that, that sort of neoliberal context gives to the market. Um, and almost a decade ago, I started exploring these, uh, these issues and these criticisms, these critiques of contemporary public space, and, and wrote the book Capital Spaces, which was a reflection on the criticisms, and an investigation through empirical work. I'll say more about in a second. But many of those criticisms, many of those critiques of public space, really focused around the position that commercial interests have been given in cities such as London, where I'm from, but also many cities around the world, the position that commercial interests have been given in decision-making about the future of our built environment, particularly public spaces. There's arguments that rather than creating public spaces that are, that are good for all of us, that commercial interests create public spaces in their own image, you know, the shopping mall, the corporate business park, the gated residential enclave, that these things are about the profit and not about those other elements of value that I mentioned briefly at the start of the talk. So there's criticisms there. There's also criticisms that in many cities around the world, the dominance of commercial interests has led to a marginalization of public interests and of public authorities. Um, and also a marginalization of those with less choice. So some people argue that our cities have become less equitable. Um, those of us with less choice are less able to use those cities in the way that they might wish to. And then there's also narratives around the fact that the public sector very often has been a little bit neglectful of many of our public spaces. Again, these are criticisms in the literature and they're global criticisms as well. So we see them internationally around the world. So these are the sorts of criticisms that I was interested in and interesting in understanding, which led eventually to, to this book, Capital Spaces. Now, the book stemmed from a two-year project. And the project tried to look at how we design, how we develop, how we then use and subsequently manage public spaces in cities. And I utilize London as the sort of vehicle for exploring those 
processes, partly because that's where I live and that's where I work, but also because as a global city and as sort of an exemplar of those neoliberal processes, it was a ready-made case study on my doorstep to understand some of these criticisms and understand, are, you know, are they right? Um, or should we push back on some of those criticisms? And the project, as I say, it was a two-year two, two project, more or less. Uh, we did all sorts of things. and we, we basically, we did a survey of, of spaces across the city. We, we did some detailed work of, of, of a series of case study projects. We interviewed lots of people. We did observational studies. All sorts of different methods we used to try and understand, as I say, this process of creating and using and managing public spaces. Now, the book concluded that whilst we should rightly be concerned about feelings of neglect and insecurity, as well as anything that seeks to exclude any users of public space, in fact, on the whole, the multiple complex public spaces of cities such as, Lon as, uh, cities, uh, such as London are generally something to celebrate. And actually, the best cities have a diversity of different space, public space types. So the book concluded, the multiple complex spaces of cities each have different purposes, just as the rooms in a house or buildings in a city have different functions. It would be foolish to try and design all, all public spaces according to some idealized blueprint for the perfect public space that is equally appealing to all. And when you read some of the literature, that's almost the impression that you get, that there's this perfect public space that everybody is going to feel equally positive about. And that's not the reality of cities. The reality of cities is they're messy in complex places. And a, and, and a space that one of you may like, I may not like. And actually, it's the diversity which makes for great cities. So part of the conclusion, I suppose, was actually it's complex. And in fact, I suppose we were also writing the book, and I suppose this is 10 years ago now, at a time when in London, like many cities around the world, there was a sort of re-engagement and a reinvestment in public spaces across Europe. Uh, and a huge investment both by the public, by public sector and by the private sector in this collective public realm. Nevertheless, the most despairing of the narratives that I was investigating at that time was around the so-called privatization of public spaces. And this is a narrative that has persisted it's widely written about and criticisms of public space as being privatized. We, we, we read widely in the literature. And so, a little bit later on, quite recently, I returned to that particular critique, that particular criticism, to investigate it further. Now, what are we talking about here when we're talking about the privatization of public space? Well, we're talking about when ownership and control of those spaces, spaces that we would normally regard as public spaces, in fact are controlled by private organizations, by private companies, rather than by the state. That's essentially what we're talking about. So, a public space, it looks like a public space. Here's one in Prague. It looks like a public space, but in fact, it's owned and managed by a private corporation. Is it public? Is it private? 
So why start, whilst I focus on London in this talk, in terms of the evidence that I'll present to you, the lessons, and I think the analysis, are universal. And particularly universal when we look outside of Europe's borders. Because countries such as China, large parts of the Middle East, um, Southern Africa, large parts of Latin America, in particular, are grappling with these questions of the privatization of public space. Now, sometimes these processes are linked to particular cultural traditions, in China, for example. But more often, they're linked to the shutting off of themselves from the rest of society, of more affluent groups in society, those who have the choice and who take the choice to shut themselves off from others. And sometimes that is guided or pushed by marketing factors which promote particular models of the city, models that are perhaps more private, more privatized. Um, so those who can afford it can shut themselves off from the rest uh, of society. This particular image is an advert for uh, a particular development in the new administrative capital of Egypt. And countries such as Egypt have a lot of this um, gating off, if you like, of large parts of the city from uh, the rest of the traditional city. In the UK, um, and particularly in London, there's been a lot written about this subject recently. There's been a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, a lot of concern in the media about the privatisation of public space, spearheaded by the Guardian newspaper. And in particular, a couple of years ago, they ran a series of pieces in which they mapped through London, sent the centre of London, they mapped all, all the spaces that they identified as privatised public spaces. And they denounced those processes in uh, the newspaper as privately owned uh, and managed spaces. So here we're talking about these sorts of spaces, often sort of quite corporate feeling spaces, rather than some of those more residential spaces, like the example I gave you in Egypt. So these sorts of places, like Paddington Basin, for example, or Canary Wharf, has many such spaces uh, of this nature. And the resulting debates that we've had have given rise to quite polemical um, narratives on both sides of the discussion. So the first set of debates or arguments, if you like, is represented by The Guardian in, in this sort of long-running campaign uh, that I mentioned. On publishing their map, of these privatized public spaces. They, the headline that followed them was, these squares are our squares, be angry. They were saying to Londoners that we should be angry about these processes of privatization uh, in the city. Their arguments go like this. London is increasingly reliant on large, powerful developers to create the public realm. And effectively, they are privatizing large parts of the city by retaining ownership uh, of those spaces and the long-term management responsibility. And the Guardian and others argue that they do so at the expense of citizens' rights, some of whom are excluded whilst other activities are restricted. So 
may argue that these are fundamentally negative processes that they say should be campaigned against. Much more rarely voiced publicly is the other side of the argument, the other polemical position, sometimes voiced by private development interests. Um, and this counter-argument argues that privatization of public space has distinct benefits. Its most vociferous advocate has been Patrick Schumacher of Zaha Hadid Architects who in the past has gone as far as saying that all public space should be privatized because he suggested that would bring a new wave of entrepreneurial energy to our cities and to the management of our cities. So these arguments go like this. The public sector struggles to devote adequate resources to the creation and management of public spaces what I was saying about the neglect of public spaces. So developers and investors have a legitimate interest in helping to fill that gap. In so doing, they are protecting their own investment and save money for taxpayers, taking on the costs of managing public spaces. So a new public space is created. The public sector doesn't have to pay for its long-term management. The developers are doing that for them. Of course, the arguments uh, are two polemical positions. The reality, I think, is never quite as simple as that, as I'm going to suggest in the remainder of this talk. My own capital spaces research that I mentioned earlier, drawing from extensive analysis of the design development, use and management of public spaces across London, suggested that private ownership and management of public spaces is in fact absolutely nothing new. It's not like a, a new thing that we've suddenly become aware of. Cities, in fact, are full of privately owned but publicly accessible spaces and always have been. My own university, UCL, if you, if you visit that part of London, is full of spaces like this on the left, which are privately owned and managed by the university. The sign is a sign on one of our Bartlett buildings, which actually half of the street, half of the pavement is owned by the university privately. The other half is owned by Camden Council. And when you walk down the street, you wouldn't know you were walking on which, whose ownership you were in. So the, this is, these are not new, we've had for decades, perhaps centuries, this complex patterns of ownership and management in our cities. And in reality, the very term privatization of public space is itself confusing because it assumes that once publicly owned spaces have somehow become private in what I've suggested in another uh, uh, talk is uh, or can be equated to a new wave of enclosures. So in, the, in, in England, in the 16th century, there was this movement to enclose the countryside. In country, the countryside, were, you know, walls and, and, and fences and hedges were put around large parts of the countryside. And the ownership was moved from a common ownership to private ownership. And this idea of pr privatization of public space can be seen in a similar way. It's a move, it, you know, it, the argument is it's a movement from public to private. Well, in fact, that rarely, rarely happens. And I think in the UK, as across Europe, that rarely happens. And this was confirmed when I started to examine in more detail the map that the Guardian had put together and started to look at the, the spaces that they'd identified. They'd identified 54 spaces that they say were privatized public spaces in the center of London. And I did this using um, historical overlays, uh, using ordnance survey maps 
um, to look, at, look back in history at what these places were before the current developments that were being criticized. And the analysis revealed actually no privatization had occurred. Instead, what we had seen in London over the past three decades was a sort of opening up through redevelopment of formerly private, walled, and gated off parts of our cities. Usually through large-scale redevelopment of former docks, uh, former industrial areas, former infrastructure. And so, for example, when I started to interrogate the, 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 the data that the Guardian had put together, what we found is that 84% of those 57 spaces um, had, uh, were of that type, that they were of, you know, e either in industrial use previously or um, former infrastructure. So not, not public spaces at all, but walled off and gated. The remaining were historically privately owned and managed spaces that, that had stayed in that um, status, if you like. So in fact, what we were seeing is something a little bit different than The Guardian described. Um, and it extended not just to commercial spaces of the sort that I've showed, but also to the opening up of some of London's post-war housing estates, which had been characterized by these sorts of spaces, rather unloved and unused spaces, and instead had been turned into parks that were open to the public and were being used. So, Different sorts of processes seem to be at play rather than those that had been described. So bringing space properly into use, if it, even if it remains in private ownership, potentially you could argue that's, that's a gain to society. It's rather than a privatization of public space, it's a publicization of private space. So it's looking at it in a different way. And arguably, that's what we've witnessed, this publicization of formerly private space. The huge King's Cross railway lands redevelopment is a case in point, where the space is being created from these former railway lands, private cut-off railway lands, have quickly become well-used and valued parts of the city and collectively a distinctive new quarter or district of London. At the same time, they are well managed and maintained by a private corporation in a manner that gives a lot back to society. And arguably, if following the construction of this project, all the public spaces had been given back to the local authority, then first they would have to have been built at a much lower standard because the authority wouldn't take on the management of these sorts of spaces. But secondly, they wouldn't have the, the program of events and activities that go on there. So you could argue that, in fact, there has been a real gain here from a space or part of London that was inaccessible to anybody to a part of London that is now accessible to everybody and is a high-quality public realm, well-managed and maintained with events and activities for uh, everyone in society. Personally, I would argue that morally and pragmatically, it really doesn't matter who owns and manages public spaces. What matters is how public they are, how genuinely public they are. In other words, what are our rights as citizens within space? And what are the responsibilities to us, 
of those who own and manage those spaces. That's what really matters. And I think we can get stuck on polemical arguments about who owns and manages without thinking actually about what is the real problem here, and that is whether those spaces are properly public spaces or not. That's the real critical issue. Looking at the issue from an alternative viewpoint, many publicly owned and managed spaces are also highly restrictive in their own ways. Most London boroughs, for example, um, have extensive lists of bylaws that restrict what you can and can't do in key spaces around uh, the city. In Leicester Square, for example, this is an image of Leicester Square. These are, the, these are the rules and regulations governing what you can and can't do uh, in Leicester Square. Including some very strange ones. You're not allowed to race or train dogs. Uh, you're not allowed to hang out your linen to dry, your washing in other words. You're not allowed to sell or let or hire anything or otherwise solicit or collect money, so you can't collect for charity, for example. Uh, you're not allowed to do public speeches or sermons or play music um, or shoot firearms, that seems a sensible one. Uh, you're not allowed to fly model aircraft, or, well, at, le if at least if they're driven by combustible substances. Uh, and people in a verminous or offensively dirty condition uh, are not allowed to lie on or occupy the, the, uh, the, the seats, the benches in Leicester Square. Trafalgar Square has an even longer list of things that you are not allowed to do, including, interestingly, taking of any photograph without prior written permission for the purpose of or in connection with business, trade, profession or employment. So this photograph, which I took in connection with my trade as an academic for my project, Capital Spaces, is illegal. Um, I shouldn't have taken it without getting permission, according to the rules and regulations. Of course, most people ignore those rules and regulations, which uh, is often what happens. And of course, many spaces, many publicly owned and managed spaces have no such restrictions, have no bylaws that affect them. It's not everywhere that has such bylaws, but some places do. Others don't have any. And then the test is simply that you're free to do what you want to do within the law of the land, but the key test is nuisance. Are you causing any nuisance to anybody else? And so, for example, the difference between these two images is that this person here who stands every day at Oxford Circus with his sign, is not causing anybody any nuisance because he stands there and people pretty much ignore him. But these people who were camped in Parliament Square were the courts determined that they were causing a nuisance because by camping out in Parliament Square to protest, they weren't allowing others to protest in Parliament Square. So there was a nuisance and therefore they were told they couldn't do that whereas he carries on doing that. The same goes for privately owned and managed but publicly accessible spaces. Some of these privately owned and managed spaces have needless, petty restrictions on their use, such as taking photos. This is me being told off for taking a photo, actually of him, uh, a security guard in this space as part of my capital spaces research. So this was about 10 years ago, I was told off. Interestingly, this is a space right outside the town hall of one of, London one of London's boroughs, Tower Hamlets. In London, however, um, one of the most active and vibrant public spaces in the city is the walk along the south bank of the Thames. And here, spaces brim with economic and social exchange of all different types. 
But as you walk along that route, you're going through a hodgepodge of private and public ownerships. And you never really know when you're moving from one to another. And that, in a sense, is how the best bits of the city work. You don't really know who's responsible for the bit you're in. And you can pretty much do what you want, as long as you're not causing anybody a nuisance and you're within the law of the land. And we can find similar situations uh, across the UK. And some public spaces are owned by institutions, whether it's universities, churches, corporations and businesses, charitable trusts, um, and the vast majority of spaces in a city like London are still owned and managed by the public sector. All, I would argue, have a role to play in this diversity of cities. Uh, not, not cities, diversity of spaces that makes up cities and which makes up great urban life. The Occupy camp of 2011, and this is part of the Occupy protest, most of you are far too young to remember these things, um, but the Occupy protests were with us for a while in cities around the world, and it just so happened that this one located itself on a piece of land that was privately owned and managed, owned by the Church of England. And because they were on that, they, they, they were able to stay there for months and months because the Church of England decided they didn't want to uh, get an injunction to get them moved. What detracts, I would say, from our experience of public space is when spaces that should be open and unrestricted and free to use for various reasons are not. And when such spaces are publicly owned and managed, then very often we can blame the overzealous instincts of many of our regulators who um, sometimes try to restrict things when there's no good reason necessarily to restrict things. Um, they think it's perhaps safer to try and restrict things than not to, to restrict things. This is a sign that was put up on a street just around the corner from where I was living a few years ago, um, which says that no... Well, you're not allowed to do various things, including spitting. I've never, ever seen anybody spit on this particular street or any street in the neighborhood that I live. So why we needed a sign to tell us not to spit, I don't know. The sign, to me, was more offensive than the act of seeing somebody doing it, which I never did. And sometimes we have, there's an instinct to try and prevent things, try and stop things happening by the private sector as well. This is a sign in a space in the city of London. You're not allowed to smoke or eat or drink or sit in this space. Clearly an overzealous owner and manager of that space, trying to stop people doing things that you would think normally you'd be able to do in a public space uh, in a city. So whether public spaces are publicly or privately owned and managed, we should, I think, oppose all needless, petty restrictions on what we can and can't do, unless there are very good reasons for those restrictions to be put in place, which arguably, and very often, I think there aren't. And so I've argued, really ever since we published capital spaces, that what we need in a city like London is a charter of public space rights and responsibilities, a charter which sets out for public authorities and private organisations what are our rights as citizens and what are the responsibilities of those who own and manage spaces towards us. And critically, the point at which this charter should apply is the point at which, through regulation, we give permission to development to happen. Because as soon as something is built, it's too late to change it. So it's at that point, you're giving permission. In England, it's called planning permission. At that point, 
you need to say, these are our expectations, these are the rights that we want to see safeguarded, and write that into the permissions process. Now, such a charter should, as I say, form the basis for whatever the system of development consents is in whichever city we're talking about. And it should incorporate, I would argue, all new and refurbished public spaces, regardless of ownership, regardless of their type. In other words, it would apply to all urban spaces, both existing and those still to be built, that a reasonable person would regard as public, whether privately or publicly owned. This would cover all spaces that during daylight hours are usually open and free to enter. So whatever the nature of the space is, if most of us as reasonable people would regard it as public space, when we're looking at it, we think that's a public space, then it should be open and accessible with our rights and responsibilities safeguarded. And so a few years ago, I wrote and put out there a straw man charter of rights and responsibilities, a straw man charter being just a thought experiment of what such a charter might look like. And this was it. That's it. Not very long. More important than the wording of this charter is the principles underpinning it. And the principles are that with rights comes responsibilities. That if you want to have permission to own and manage a space, you have responsibilities to those who are using it. But also, us who are using that space also have responsibilities to each other and to society. Principles should apply regardless of ownership. It doesn't matter if it's publicly owned or privately owned and managed. The principles should apply. It's about safeguarding freedoms, not restricting behaviours. So there's this mentality, I think, that we've got to restrict things that we don't like. Whereas, in fact, we'd be better off spending our time trying to safeguard all the things that we like people going out and using and engaging with each other in public spaces and so forth. Keep it simple. Don't control more than necessary. It doesn't need to be a hugely complicated document. And keep it clear so that it can be understood by everybody, not just built environment professionals. Now, interestingly, a little while after writing this and putting it out there, the Mayor of London picked up on this idea and included a commitment in the London plan to produce his own charter for London. In the, uh, in, in the London plan, which has just been adopted. And that charter was, after some time, about four years or so, uh, written and adopted. And that is it, slightly, slightly longer than mine. Um, and it more or less incorporates some of the principles in the straw man charter that I put out there, although it's a bit more generic in terms of its principles. Um, they're guidance rather than prescription. So local authorities and developers don't have to follow this charter if they don't want. And I think that's perhaps problematic. We've yet to see how effective it will be. It's only recently been published. Um, I would have argued for something that was more prescriptive, more tied to the permission, so that actually developers uh, and others had to follow the principles in the chart. That's not the direction that the Mayor of London has gone down. So we'll see how effective it is. Myself, I had the opportunity to put some of these principles into practice. Um, we're working on, uh, with the London Borough of Wandsworth, who approached me after seeing a presentation similar to this, uh, and they approached me to say, could I work with them? And the five developers, plus the American Embassy and the Metropolitan Police, 
who were involved in the largest regeneration project in London at that time, and still, which is the Nine Elms development on the south bank of the Thames. And in the heart of this development was a linear park. And that linear park goes through the ownerships of five different developers and the American embassy. So each of those developers, ultimately, when it's built, will own a bit of this. And Wandsworth were interested, the London Borough of Wandsworth were interested in ensuring that it was appropriately managed. But also the developers were interested in that as well, because if you own only a part of something, then your investment is affected by how your neighbouring developers manage their bit. So there's a sort of interest between the developers, as well as between the developers and the public sector, in ensuring that the park is properly managed in the public interest. Anyway, the work that we then did started off with a round table to discuss, and we started off with the straw man charter. There's that text that I briefly put up on the, on the, on the screen. That was our starting point, and we had a, around the table, we started debating those principles, deciding which were appropriate uh, and w which were not. And actually, it was almost the easiest commission that I've ever had because pretty quickly, all the developers pretty much agreed with almost everything that was in uh, that charter. Certain things were tweaked and changed, but most things were agreed upon. And that's the charter there. You won't be able to read it. You don't need to read it. Uh, it's a little bit longer than my original one. Um, and this charter will form part of the management plan for this park, which will be owned by a company owned collectively by all of those five developers on whose board will sit the local authority. So one, the London Borough of Wandsworth will sit on the board to ensure that the charter is properly implemented. It's also tied to the planning permission that's being given for each of the developments along its length by a legal agreement called a Section 106 agreement. So it's tied legally as well to those permissions. And, of course, the local authority didn't want to take on responsibility for the park because, well, public sector in the UK is always strapped for cash. They've never got enough money to spend on all the things they want to. So if somebody else will pay for things like managing a space like this, then they would argue that that is a good thing. But as long as they can ensure that those rights are guaranteed, and that's where the charter came in. It will be publicly visible to all park users, online and physically, dealing with one of the issues that The Guardian in particular identified, that very often you don't know who's responsible for a place. And so if you're challenged, if somebody says to you, you can't take a photo here, you want to know under whose authority do they say that and how do I challenge it? And so that needs to be very clear as well. The charter itself is written in positive language throughout, encouraging rather than discouraging behaviours. So everyone is welcome to use the park, and it says that explicitly. Very little is prohibited. Just three things are prohibited. One is lighting fires. You can't light fires in the park. The second is you can't camp in the park. And the third thing is you can't park in the park or drive in the park. So those three things are prohibited. Everything else is not prohibited. And clear responsibilities are set out for all parties, including instructions for what you need to do if you want to do something which isn't specifically listed. So if you wanted to hold a big party in the park, you can do that, but you need to go and uh, get permission for that. And there's instructions of how to do that and what the process is. So in this way, what it's designed to do is protect the public interest whilst at the same time trying to protect the private interests of those who live around the park. Because lots of people will be living around, looking over the park, and they have interests as well. 
So they want to live in a place that most of the time is reasonably peaceful and quiet and, 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 and so forth. As well as the American embassy, which is based on the part which has particular security issues. So charters at a citywide or local scales, of course, are just one way of dealing with these questions of ownership and management. Um, and ensuring that wherever responsibilities lie, the rights of citizens should be guaranteed seems to me to be an absolute critical role of the public sector, however, however eventually they decide to do that. Ignoring this space, ignoring these issues, creates the tensions and criticisms that we've seen in London and other cities in recent years. So cities are diverse places. Diversity is in their nature. Um, it's their essence. It's the essence of great cities is diversity. And I would say we shouldn't restrict them or their public spaces into one-size-fits-all uh, design and management approaches just for narrow political or dogmatic reasons. So those dogmatic arguments I started off with, I wouldn't favour either side of that debate. I think, there's, as I say, it's more complex, it's more nuanced. At the same time, we do need to safeguard the rights and responsibilities of all. And as I say, that's a critical role of the public sector. However we decide to do that, it seems to me critical, regardless of ultimate ownership and management responsibilities, whether that's vested in the public sector or in private interests. Unfortunately, these are a set of issues which I think are not taken nearly seriously enough, I think, in many developments, certainly in London, but also in many other cities uh, and countries around the world. If you're interested in the arguments uh, that I put forward in a, a longer discussion of them, there's a paper, which you probably can't read that, but it says, the publicization of private space. If you're interested in these arguments, you can download that paper free from the Journal of Urban Design, the publicization of private space. If you Google it, it'll come up. Um, and that explores them and the literature around this in much more detail. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Mathieu, and let's hope there are a few questions. Uh, I think uh, Katka is looking online if there is anything and uh, from the students here. Yes, please. Yes, you can have a question even if you're not a student. Thank you for the lecture, Professor. I was wondering if... Uh, when you were debating about the Elms Park, was it? Uh, was there any discussion on not only the rules and regulations, but also the enforcement of them? Because uh, I think one thing is whether there are rules, and the other thing, if there is anybody who is enforcing the behavior or controlling the behavior or checking the behavior. Could you talk a little bit about that? Thank you. Yeah, because... When we go back to my example, Leicester Square and not being able to do all those things that you're not able to, able to do. You're not allowed to put your linen out and various things. There's nobody enforcing that. And uh, many of those regulations are so old that you wouldn't expect necessarily to be enforced. But you're absolutely right. that If you have something like a charter, there needs to be some system in place to ensure that um, those you know, regulations are, are meaningful. So in Nine L. Uh, there will be a management organization which is set up um, a, as a combined organization across all of those ownerships plus the local authority. And that, or, that organization will have day-to-day -day responsibility for the park. Uh, and they will be responsible for ensuring that the, the charter is appropriately delivered. And I think what that really means is ensuring that those interests, those public interests of citizens are maintained and that 
you know, you don't, some security guard doesn't come along and say, you can't take a photograph of that. You know, what are you doing? Um, cycling in my park. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, th that management organization will have responsibility for that. The critical thing is, if they ever step beyond what it says in the charter, then citizen can go and say, right, well, this, this is what was agreed. This is the charter. You're stepping beyond. I have a right to do this, that, and the other. Now, hopefully, they'll never need to do that because, you know, it, it'll be just part and parcel of, of the approach to governing those spaces. And I think the King's Cross example I gave is interesting because... The King's Cross development is a development which has, a, has quite a few privately owned public spaces in it, but it also has publicly owned, private space, uh, publicly owned spaces because the developers gave the streets back to the council but kept the squares. Um, and those squares are managed in a very, um, what would the word be? Well, quite a sort of loose and, 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 and free way. So you don't see a lot of security guards around or you don't feel there's somebody watching you in CCTV. I mean, I'm sure there are CCTV there. But um, it, it, it feels quite free and you can go there and have fun and enjoy yourself, whatever you want to do. Um, and so I think we can have these places that are managed in a, in a, in a sensible way, whether it's by the public sector or the private sector. Um, but... In Trowger Square, that I also mentioned, there are particular, I don't know what they're called, wardens, I think they're called, whose responsibility is, it is that you're, you're not allowed to do, well, you, you, shouldn't do, you shouldn't feed the pigeons, for example, in Trowger Square, and they do stop you if you feed the pigeons. You shouldn't, you shouldn't go paddling in, in, in the fountains, which seems a shame, but apparently that's part of the regulations. Um, so, yeah, so in Trafalgar Square, they have these wardens there. I, I don't, I think that the regulations there go too far. But you're right, you need somebody to, to do that. Has there been any change during the COVID period? Because your research started definitely before that. In the um, what? So in during the, the period of the COVID. Okay, oh, oh, um, well... I, I don't think there's been any change in terms of necessarily the agenda that I've been talking about, there's, but there's certainly been change in terms of the way that people engage with spaces in the city. Um, and we've seen, you know, like everywhere, I suppose, restrictions, temporary restrictions being put on how people can use uh, the city's streets and spaces, particularly high streets, shopping streets and so forth have been restricted in terms of where you can walk and, and all those things. Um, hopefully that's temporary. Many of those restrictions really have been removed now, whether they'll, with the latest up flare, I don't know, things may, be, may come back. Um, we've yet to see, but yeah, certainly people's engagement and, and relation to public space has changed a lot in that period. I remember in the middle of the first lockdown we had in London, going into the centre of London, going to Trafalgar Square in the, in the middle of a, a Saturday. And I was there and there was two cyclists in the middle of Trafalgar Square, which if you know Trafalgar Square is normally absolutely full of tourists. And so, yeah, it was, our relationship with public space changed, but I hope not permanently. Questions from online. This is always tricky because they write it in Czech and I have to know it's in English this time. Thank you for whoever wrote it. So do you see any specifics of these issues in Prague given your engagement in the Florence 21 jury? Well, um, I think these are issues that Prague, like any city, should be thinking about. Um, I put up on the screen a space which I think is privately owned and managed, but you might tell me it isn't. Um, and I think the city will have spaces like that and will have more if the Florence development is built out. And so these are things that the city should be thinking about, I think. 
Um, now, whether it's a charter or whether it's some other approach, I don't know what would be the right approach here. Every city obviously has to make its own decisions. But I think, um, you know, if a city is not thinking about those issues when the permissions are given, then you can't change it later. So if a, if a space is not managed in a way which is good for society, then it becomes very difficult to change it later without some sort of national legislation, which you know, almost never happens. So I would say Prague should be thinking about those issues, but I should say every city should be thinking about these issues. And very often they don't. You know, it's, it's only very recently in London that we've started thinking about these issues. And partly because you know, the Guardian, I don't necessarily agree with all their analysis, but the, the really positive part they played is in getting the debate going mm -hmm. and getting these issues on the public consciousness in the public agenda so, so that the mayor became interested and started thinking about it and so forth. I think with the charter, definitely, suddenly the privatization of public space uh, goes under a different viewpoint. It, it changes uh, the, the sort of the approach to it. It, it. it became something very negative, and suddenly you're showing also the positive side of, yeah. of private public space. Yeah, so I'm coming back to the Florence example. If, I mean, you're no Florence now, a part of the city here in Prague. and. You know, it's not an area that has many positive public spaces. It's, it's, it's dominated by infrastructure and uh, buses moving to and fro and, and, and all things which need to happen in cities. But it could be somewhere so much better. And, and, and as part of that process, I think, we need to think about these issues. There was a question up there. Thank you. I would like to ask about the suburbs of the cities which clearly lack funding in London and every big cities in the world. They clearly lack some regulation from the authorities, some legislative, I don't know. And uh, uh, these parts of the cities are clearly less prosperous and because they're managed by the government and the government clearly lacks the resources to make these public spaces more accessible to everyone, like better for everyone in essence. And I'd like to ask if maybe in your opinion it is better to enforce the privatization of those spaces in the more, in the less, uh, like flourishing and thriving areas of the cities, if uh, maybe privatization of those spaces could help uh, develop those spaces for everyone, when maybe the government doesn't just have the means to do so? No, I would never advocate the privatization of public spaces as, as a solution. I think if developments happen in which there are privately owned and managed spaces, then we need to be aware of what the consequences are and we need to ensure that's managed appropriately. But I would never say, uh, like Patrick Schumacher, that spaces should be privately owned and managed. I think sometimes they can be and sometimes they can manage, be managed exceptionally well in private hands. Uh, and sometimes they shouldn't be. And the vast majority of our cities are managed day-to-day -day by the public sector. Um, and that's how they should remain. But I think, you know, good city authorities are those that recognize that the public realm is a vitally important part of our cities and that they have responsibilities to manage that appropriately. Coming back to the question about COVID, we did some research um, that focused on people's experiences of their neighborhoods across the UK during the lockdowns. And the three things that thousands of people told us across the UK were, they wanted neighborhoods that were walkable, that they could walk and feel safe while walking, they wanted access to green spaces locally within walkable distance from their homes. And they wanted access to local shops 
within walkable distances of their home. You know, nothing outstanding, but these are the essential elements of good cities that allow us to lead healthy, environmentally sustainable lifestyles. And I think public authorities have a critical responsibility in delivering that, and they should take that responsibility seriously. So if they're not managing their spaces well, then they need to look at themselves and, and, and think, right, how can we do that better? And that doesn't necessarily mean lavishing lots and lots of money on, on the public realm, but it means maybe uh, doing it a little bit you know, more, more clever, um, more smartly than they have been in the past. Uh, we spend a lot of money on, on, inf on roads infrastructure and so forth. If we spent a little bit of that on cycle infrastructure and uh, walking infrastructure and, and parks, just a fraction of that, I think we'd be, have better cities. And I think the public sector needs to, needs to lead that charge. It's not going to come from the private sector. But when we have private actors involved, then they should take a responsibility as well. I think that's the point that I would make. And I think interestingly, just, just another point, many of our suburbs have a lot more private, private privately owned and managed public spaces than necessarily we realize. You know, a lot of the suburban developments, commercial developments, and so big box developments on the ex out outskirts of our cities are often owned and managed by, you know, private interests. Um, and so I think these issues are not just about the city centers, they're about the whole city. Any other questions? Online again. So there's a question. Um, is the term that you're using publicization? Isn't it a big, a bit exaggerated? Uh, the more, and now there's a abbreviation POP which I don't really know what it is, but probably you Pops, know, yes. POPs. There are the bigger their share. In certain parts of cities, they can soon prevail at the expense of truly public spaces. Since the charter and other solutions are minor, don't you see a danger in that trajectory of development? Yeah, POPs means privately owned public spaces which is the sort of privatized public spaces that I was referring to. That's just, and that's a term um, that's sometimes used for them. Do I think privatization of public space, uh, or publicization of private space is exaggerated? Not really, no. I think inevitably there's a bit of exaggeration in this because there's a bit of exaggeration in the other way. You know, when we talk about privatization of public space. I think that's an exaggeration because, in fact, we're not really talking about privatization of anything. And maybe, the, maybe I could be accused of exaggeration in the other way as well. But I think, on the whole, it, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about bits of cities that weren't in the public realm coming into the public realm. Now, yes, they may, the, the, the long-term responsibility and ownership may stay in the private in private hands, but nevertheless, they are bits of the public realm of our cities. And so, so there is a publicization of those spaces. So, yeah, I mean, we could, we could argue about that, but I think it's, yeah, I think it's relevant. Thank you. I had a question back to COVID. You said that you hope that the changes that were in the, in the public space will come back to when they were like the, the limitations in the public space, that they would come back to before COVID times. But when uh, I visit uh, Paris quite often, and uh, it changed completely during this year and a half, and uh, I think the mayor, Annie Heldelga, just took total opportunity of the problem, and uh, nearly 50% of many streets are now separated from car, car traffic, and hand it over to, to the sort of what we, what we call the micro traffic. Uh, 
cyclists and, and scooters, little scooters, etc. Mm. And this change, of course, was done for COVID because uh, the people needed to move and they, they, they didn't want to have them clamped up in buses and in public transport. But it seems to be something which is going to stay even in the future calming down the city in this way. So do you see a difference between the, the approach in Paris and the approach in London? No, I mean, I think that sounds like a very positive experience. Um, and yeah, I think there, there will be positive things come, comes out of the whole horrible COVID experience. Um, and one of them may be that we re reacquaint ourselves with the joys of neighborhoods that we can walk to shops and so forth, like I mentioned previously, um, and of streets which are not dominated by traffic. And if, if that can come out of it, then that's excellent. I suppose what I was referring to was, I hope that we will be brave enough to return to public space. Because I think we went through a period, and we're still there to some extent, where people are still shying away from public space. If you go to the centre of London now, and probably Paris is the same, um, it's, it's not nearly as lively as it was pre-COVID. People are still working from home a lot, and that's going to stay. That's, you know, the technology is with us, that's going to stay. Um, tourists are not coming so much. Um, and I hope that that will change and we will re-engage more with our cities and the excitement of cities and being together in cities. But also, it means different cities. So it means not necessarily doing all the things we were doing before. So people are not going to necessarily be commuting into work five times a week in a city like London. They may go in once or twice. And then the city needs to reinvent itself a little bit. It needs to say, right, well, what, what are we going to do with all this surplus space in buildings as well as in public space? And how are we going to use it? So I think there's going to be a reinventing process, but hopefully also as part of a re-engaging process. I suppose that's the point I was trying to make. Uh, you're in the jury of the Florence 21, and one of the big problems there is the Magistrala, the artery road going through the center of Prague. And uh, you probably know that we have something like maybe 30 years of discussions what to do with it, with many idea workshops uh, being placed there. Uh, what's your opinion of that road? My opinion is uh, the city needs to be brave and needs to demolish it. Demolish it even as a bridge or keep it as a high line? Well, I would, I would demolish it altogether. <laughs> I mean, clearly, at some point, it needs to get across the tracks and so forth. And, and, and so there's, there's complexities here. I'm being oversimplistic. But I think for much of its length, it doesn't need to exist as a structure, as a thing. It could be down at grade level. You can still have uh, a road. Uh, hopefully reduced in volume and the amount of traffic using it. But I think it could be down at grade level rather than up in the sky. I think high lines are all very well if they're in the right place and of the right sort of infrastructure. I think generally, whatever it is, six-lane motorways probably won't make a particularly good high line. Uh, it'll still be a very unattractive thing that still needs, it would still cost a lot to maintain and manage it. Much better to bring the traffic down to grade, is my opinion. Thank you. Any other question? As you can see, you can even ask local questions, not only general questions. But when you ask a local question, you have to be ready just to ignore me, because I'm probably talking absolute nonsense. I would like to ask uh, about uh, your chart also tackle the problem of uh, behavior data collection because uh, this is uh, typically in the United States that the privatization of public spaces are sometimes also uh, the motive for that is somehow linked to the data collection and uh, also the control by closed circuit uh, TV and other sensors. Thank you. Yeah, so 
So the argument is that increasingly in our, our smart cities, there's a lot of data that can be collected about us and about our use of public space, and does that need to be controlled? Now, this is not something that we dealt with in the Nine Elms Charter because there's no intention to gather that data. Um, it is something interesting that is dealt with in the new, in the principles of the Mayor's Charter, the London-wide Mayor's Charter that I briefly flashed up. Um, that there needs to be, uh, I, I can't remember how he words it, but I think that, you know, that to people's data, privacy needs to be appropriately safeguarded. Um, so that would be images and CCTV, it needs to be destroyed after a period of time. Uh, it would be uh, a ban on, on, on collecting uh, data of people's movements or facial recognition software and those sorts of things. So there's lots of new technologies that are coming on stream and I think we have to be very careful about how we regulate those because I think they do need regulating that, you know, that you know, Google doesn't know absolutely everything about all of us all of the time. Um, and can use that for various commercial purposes. And we need to be careful about that, I think. But there exists something like voluntary data collection, not only, not only supervision over the space, but that, that people themselves are voluntarily collecting data that they uh, hand over to, to, yeah. to know if the city's working the way it should work. Yeah, I think if somebody, you know, if somebody voluntarily gives their data to whoever, whichever company it is, then, you know, absolutely fine. You know, that's, that's their decision, of course. But I think there's a distinction between that and, and data which is gathered involuntarily. And certainly there are examples in the States where, you know, there have been bits of cities planned, I think, don't think always delivered, but nevertheless planned, that would collect a lot more data on how we use those bits of the city. And I think that starts to then create all sorts of questions around our privacy and so forth, which I think, you know, there may be benefits from that. Um, but I think we need to have that debate in society, not, not just accept it, if you like, uh, and then suddenly it's there and we're trying to do something about it. You're working in the academia, but a lot of your work is connected with governance and politics. You're sort of filling the gap between the politics and the, and the research, which, in fact, I don't think anybody is doing really in my country, as far as I can see, your type of research. Uh, what, how, how would you characterize this position, that, in fact, you're, you're doing research like academic research, but then you have to hand it over and, and try to implement it in some reasonable way? Yeah, I've always been interested. I mean, I'm an architect by background. And I suppose I trained to be an architect because I was interested in changing cities. And therefore, I suppose I've just brought that into my academic life. That I, you know, when I do something, I'm quite interested in exploring how that might be usefully used. And, you know, not all my research is used. A lot of it is ignored and <laughs> nobody ever reads it. Um, but from time to time you do something that somebody finds interesting and if they use it, then that's great. And that seems to me a positive thing that academics can do. And I've always been quite interested in doing. Well, definitely the charter, the charter of the straw man, seems to be uh, in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. It Thank certainly you. seems to have had an impact so far. So. Well done. Last questions? If there are not any more, uh, I would like to thank Matthew Camarena. Thank you very much for coming and having a November Talks lecture. And I have to thank also online the Stowe Foundation because without their support, without their financial support, the November Talk lecture series would not be possible. So it is every year, six year in a row, and we're part of several European universities mm. that are having the lectures, more or less at the same time. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.